wrote about this months ago on MLB.com, and we're going to see it play out in real time in spring. And some of the young guys, right, have been there, done that. Mm -hmm. What are players saying about it? Good morning. Good morning, Lauren. Yeah, I think now that we're in 2023, it, with, with all due respect to the sightings and trades that have defined this hot stove season, the biggest change for 2023 in baseball are these rule changes, and specifically the pitch clock. Um, spring training is going to be interesting, I think, to say the least. There's going to be a lot of adjustment to all these rules, but particularly the pitch clock, because it does affect the rhythm of the game, uh, the tempo of what the guys are doing on the mound. And at the plate, I, I think the hitter element of this is not to be overlooked. Because it is called the pitch clock, we tend to think primarily about the pitchers, uh, but the hitters are going to have a big adjustment as well uh, to be in the box on time and ready. Um, you know, you see there the particulars of this rule. And what, what makes it doubly interesting is the World Baseball Classic yeah. will be going on. So a lot of guys will be away from camp for a sustained period. And the rule changes will not be used in the World Baseball Classic. So um, it's going to be uh, grip it and rip it and, and be ready to go by opening day. Because once opening day comes, uh, they're going to be enforcing these rules. There's not going to be some some leeway period as there was in the first couple weeks of the minor league season last year. But yeah, I talked to some pitchers who were particularly fast, uh, fast workers. Brent Suter, for instance, the reliever was the fastest worker in MLB last year. He thinks conditioning is the biggest element here that, that guys will have to adjust. So he actually does uh, his conditioning drills in 20 second in increments to be ready for 20 second increments on the mound because yeah. that's that's how long he took he, he never he took like 19 seconds with runners on base uh he took about 13 seconds with no runners on base so um yeah spring training is just going to be messy and it's going to be interesting and it's going to be uh, an adjustment for everybody i remember talking with nestor cortez as well and he said he's preparing for it too and there's a cause and effect right and you cover this in your article stolen base attempts will they go up yeah. what do you think Oh, absolutely. And and so the, the pitch clock is, of course, married to, they call them, disengagement limits. Step off limits, pick off limits for the pitchers. The reason for that is when they first used a pitch timer in the minor leagues, uh, guys just worked around it by stepping off the mound and resetting the clock. So they had to couple that uh, with these disengagement limits uh, for plate appearance. And that is, if, if the minor league season is any indication, it's going to have a dramatic impact on stolen base activity. Last year, uh, the pitch clock went from being used just in one particular uh, A ball level to being used across the minor league. Stolen base attempts per game went up by about 10%. Uh, it, it's, and if you compare it to 2019, as we see there, it's, it's a, a pretty dramatic rise. So um, I think what we could see, hopefully, is a guy steal 50 bases. We didn't see that <laughs> last year. Only one guy stole 40, only five stole 30. Uh, the, the decline of the stolen base is one of the big changes in baseball in the last 20, 30 years. You go back to Harold's era when he was stealing 60 in a season in the 80s. I don't think we're going to get back to that rate of attempts per game. Uh, but I do think if uh, the minor league math applies to the major leagues, I think over time we're going to get back to that's basically the early 2000s level in terms of uh, stolen base attempts per game. And that's that's both the pitch timer and the disengagement limits and also the, the slightly bigger bases, which makes a, a modest impact as well. OK, so more stolen base attempts and less injuries. I mean, if you look at the template for the minor leagues, that's what we saw. Can you make is yeah. it fair to make that correlation? Well, so far, you know, so that was the big concern. I, I think when they experimented with the pitch clock is that the pitcher is going to be sped up. We're going to see more pitcher injuries in a game that does not need more pitcher injuries. We saw the opposite. We saw a decline in injuries. And I think what's really fascinating about the pitch clock when you think about the long term impl implications, it would take years before we see if this actually had an impact. But from talking to some people, uh, if you think about games ending routinely 20 to 25 minutes earlier uh, than they had, you think about that over the course of 162 games, 162 game season, and then over the course of a player's career, that's a dramatic difference in a player's career. So Mike Trout, for instance, we often compare Mike Trout to Mickey Mantle, right? Uh, statistically, they are pretty much incredibly aligned uh, through Mike Trout's age 30 season and Mickey Mantle's age 30 season. But I looked at it and Mike Trout spends uh, on average, about 40 hours more on his feet in center field than Mickey Mantle did in a given season. Uh, that, that's a lot over the course of the year. I talked to him about it late last season. He said that, that adds up. And that's the guy who's, of course, dealt with a lot of injuries. I'm not saying his injuries come from standing around. They actually come from moving around. But um, but it is a, a much different game than it was back in the day. And there, that's what these rule changes are aimed at, is trying to get back to a better rhythm. 
you know, get these guys off their feet a little more, get them in bed earlier. That could be the biggest difference. Uh, you, you guys had Brandon Geyer on the show a couple weeks ago. There's a guy who, you know, was a, a good fourth outfielder, carved himself out a nice seven-year career. And I, I talked to him about sleep. He thinks sleep was the big difference maker for him. He treated sleep like a sport, getting in bed on time, turning off the electronics, you know, uh, taking little pieces of tape and, and covering up every little light in the hotel room, you know, uh, blocking the bottom of the door with pillows, whatever he had to do to get in bed for 10 hours. Uh, so, you know, if, if guys treat that extra, you know, whatever it is, 20 to 25 minutes a night uh, as the opportunity it is to improve their sleep, because there's been a lot of studies about how sleep impacts, uh, you know, how, how hitters uh, are able to read pitches at the plate, et cetera. So um, it's kind of a fascinating long-term outlook. Anthony, I've been trying to tell you, that's why I go to bed at 7.30 and Matt says soft foods buffet. <laughs> yeah. Because sleep is important. boring, but it turns out you're, you're health <laughs> boring conscious. Boring yeah. and prioritizing health all in one. <laughs> tell Matt what you think of his steak order, by the way, before we go. Be honest. That's terrible. Uh, steak is, is meant to be, the, the meat is supposed to be the highlight of the steak, not the char and not whatever condiment you're putting on. I'm a huge condiment guy, but with a steak, just pouring that A1 sauce over it and ruining uh, the work of art that, that could have been on your plate. Well, sorry, everybody. <laughs> sorry, America. <laughs> uh, Anthony, thank you. Lauren, thank you. We're going to take a break. When we come back, kicking around the Hall of Fame candidacy of one of the most dominant left-handed relievers of his generation, Billy Wagner in the spotlight for Keith Costas, Harold and I next on. AJ Pollock is an on base guy. He has a new deal, short term as it may be, but he's going to a new employer, JP, that uh, has a pretty good chance to repeat as a postseason club. I like this fit. AJ Pollock to the Seattle Mariners, one year, $7 million. Jeff Passan first to report it. I love the fit because of where he's going to play and who his platoon partner is going to be. A.J. Pollock has a great track record against left-handed pitching. Of course, Jared Kelnick, a left-handed bat, uh, perhaps needs some help against the tough lefties. And so, for me right now, you look at the Seattle Mariners, they've got Teoscar Hernandez to play right, and now Pollock and Jared Kelnick I think has a chance to be a really effective uh, platoon tandem in left field with, of course, the J-Rod show playing in center. There are the numbers for A.J. Pollock. Uh, certainly, he's not maybe at that level he was with the Dodgers there in 20 and 21, but I believe a, a very effective bat uh, there in left field. And here is what that Mariner lineup could look like. I would add, and this is certainly one iteration of what the Mariner lineup could look like, I think the Mariners still have one more player to get. And the, na the name I would love to see them get is Brandon Belt and have Belt be the lefty bat as the DH. They've done a really good job of having a good foundation, Matt and Harold, of, of their bats. And I would love to see them add in Brandon Belt as their potential additional first base slash DH spot. And, and that would really have a much better balance to their lineup than what we saw potentially last year uh, where they were close. I mean, certainly they were swept by the Astros, but, but it was a close sweep. It was a competitive sweep. And I think that if you find a way to add Brandon Belt there as one more lefty bat as the DH, now you're really talking. And, and there certainly was some conversation for them with Brian Reynolds, but I believe right now when you have J-Rod in center field and the Pollock and Kelnick combination in left, if you find a way to add Brandon Belt, that's a really nice nice one through nine for the Seattle yeah, Mariner. I, I, I want to go back and stick to the Kalnick. We'll worry about Belt another time, but um, the Kalnick and this move right here with A.J. Pollock, it's a soft landing. It's a shrewd move. I think it's a, a fantastic move to let the, the air out of the young man. And if Kalnick takes off, then he plays. If he doesn't, then A.J.'s there for a soft landing, and he may get more at-bats against a right-hander.